Hi everybody, welcome back to another video. My name is Lori. In today's video, we are going to be covering five things that I would do differently if I were to be starting my reselling business in 2023. I've touched on some of these things before, but I'm going to dive deep into why I think these five things would make a big difference in my reselling business today. Five things I would change if I were starting my reselling business in 2023. Number one would be to start with things around your house and not go out and buy newly thrifted items to sell. For me, when I first got started, I was so excited about reselling that I ran to Savers and I bought a bunch of things before I really knew about looking up sold comps. I really just went on my gut and what looked pretty to me at the time. That was in 2018 and sadly enough, some of those items are still in my closet and for sale four and a half years later. By starting with stuff in your own home, it really actually has so many benefits. Number one, you're decluttering your own home. Instead of bringing new things into your home, you're actually taking things that you're not using, that have already been paid for, that might get donated anyways or tossed away, and you are practicing being a reseller using stuff that you have at your fingertips. There aren't many businesses that you can just walk around your house and start with the things that you have right there. You can make mistakes that aren't very costly. If you have a shirt that you picked up at TJ Maxx five years ago, it's in your closet, you're not wearing it anymore, you can practice with that. You can do some research on the brand, on what the sold comps are, just like anything you would find at a thrift store, except you already have the inventory in front of you. I wish so much I had started with my own stuff in my own closet. I feel like I have been playing catch up since the word go because I went so heavy on purchasing inventory outside of what I already owned. Now I regularly go through my closet and pull things, but I really feel like I could go even deeper and I could still use to skip a few thrift trips and work with what I have at home. I think it's very low risk if you are working with things that you have in your house. You may even branch out and try to sell a few things that may not be what you end up selling. So for example, I may wanna sell a couple items in my kitchen, maybe a couple appliances or knickknacks on my shelves. Even though I'm a clothing reseller, it will give me experience in a lot of different areas and then I can decide which area I want to lean into. I think if you're a little resourceful, it's amazing what you can find for free before investing and in going out to thrift stores and making mistakes that could ultimately really cost you a lot more money than necessary and eat into your profits. It also gives you the opportunity to just hit the ground running. You literally just need your cell phone, some natural lighting, and the items that you want to sell. You don't even have to leave your house and you can start your reselling business. What other profession can offer you that from the comfort of your own home? Number two is something you've all heard me talk about before if you have been around for any length of time. Get your inventory system in order as soon as possible. Even if you only have 20 items in your inventory and you think that this little side hustle is never going to amount to anything, it's amazing how quickly it can grow and it's amazing how quickly you can fall behind with inventory if you're not on top of it and if you don't have a system from the beginning. It seems crazy when you have 10 or 20 or 30 items to think that you need a system. However, speaking from my own experience, when I first started, I put things in bins. These are my sweaters, these are my jeans, these are my tops, these are my shoes. And that worked for a little while. When I first started my business, I was on the other side of this wall in my living room and I had one little tack on the wall and I was putting things on the wall, taking the pictures, using natural lighting. That was all working great. And I had two bins below my photo setup and things would go right into the bins. And then one day my husband said, Lori, you're kind of taking over the living room. Maybe you should go down to the basement. And we had like a little small, tiny exercise room in the basement that nobody was using. And Jay's like, why don't you take that room and you can store your bins down there. So then I went downstairs with my bins and then my bins grew from two to four to six bins. And I still kept this whole system. And even when I started to get the towers and put bins on shelves, I was still using that category system. The bigger my business grew, the more complicated that got and there is nothing more frustrating than not being able to find an item that you have worked so hard to photograph, list, 
share, and then it actually sells and you get paid for it, and then you can't find it. That has happened to me more than I care to admit. There are a variety of different systems you can use. I wouldn't even say that my system is the best system. I use a QR code system called Tote Scan. It's super inexpensive. I get these little stickers that I can slap right onto my bins. I scan the QR code and then I'm able to type what is right there in the bins. The reason why this system isn't perfect is because depending on what you write for your description, it may not be exactly what your item is listed as in your listing. So for example, I may have this sweater, say this is a Gap sweater. In my Poshmark listing, it says brown, slouchy, Gap sweater, size large. Then I go to tote scan it and I put it in my tote scan system and I might call it something else. Maybe I call it a dark tan sweater and I don't include the brand or the size. Those are things that I try to include, but there is a little bit of room for error. Anybody should be able to retrieve an item from your inventory if you're out of town. That's what I consider like the perfect inventory. And now on Poshmark, there is a section that is a private section for your own notes where you can include a SKU number or a bin number or a color coding system right there in your listing. And they didn't have that when I started on Poshmark. eBay always had a spot for SKU and things like that, an organization system. I started on Poshmark and there was nowhere to write where my inventory was. Um, and I think if that had been in place a while ago, I would have at least numbered the bin. Like this sweater is going in bin number six. It can be as simple as that, but come up with a system that works for you that also has a little bit of room to grow so you can change and grow your business and tweak your inventory as your business grows. I used to talk about overhauling my inventory for like three years and I finally did it last year and I still don't think it's perfect but it's so much better than it was. There's no one system that is perfect and there are a ton of videos out there on inventory systems. I can link my video here. My system may not work for you. You can check out different systems, see what might work for you best, and then really lean into it and stay as organized as possible. It is really great for your business to save time with inventory and being able to retrieve your items quickly when they sell. Like I said, there's nothing worse than losing an item, having to cancel an order, reaching out to the client to tell them that you don't have something, it affects your rating. It's just, it's lousy overall. So the sooner you get a good system in place, the sooner your business will benefit from the organization. Number three, figure out what works for your business and lean into it. And by that, I just mean try your best to limit the amount of outside opinions that come into your business. If you're anything like me, when I started, I used to consume reselling content around the clock. Right now, I'm kind of doing it with fountain pen content. Like I can't get enough of it. When I get into a hobby or I get excited about something, YouTube is my go-to place and I love it. And I remember so fondly the women who I used to follow when I first got started reselling. Empty Hanger, Street Savvy were my two favorites and I used to consume everything, everything that they put out. And I learned so much from them. But once you learn from other people, you have to figure out what works for you. Since I started reselling formally in 2018, reselling has exploded. I think when the pandemic hit in 2020, so many people started reselling. The landscape has definitely changed. There are so many people like me now on YouTube sharing tips and tricks on how to have a successful reselling business. And it can be super overwhelming. And my best advice for quieting the noise and figuring out what works for you is to do what I call cafeteria style consumption. What I mean by cafeteria style is picking and choosing from the information that you are fed and deciding what works for you. So I may watch a video and not like much of what I'm hearing, but there may be one little tidbit. Maybe I love how that person stores their inventory. Maybe I like that they give me a tip on using some keywords in my listing. Maybe I just like their style and I'm enjoying the pieces that they're picking up. I find for me, I can spend hours down various rabbit holes, insert whatever topic you want, and spend hours watching what other people are doing. But until I actually turn everything off and quiet the noise and dig in for myself, I don't really know what works 
for me until I'm doing it on my own terms. There are videos out there that say, this platform is terrible, don't sell on whatnot, Poshmark is awful, eBay is the best. It doesn't matter what anybody else says. What matters is what you like. Do you like whatnot? Do you enjoy selling on Poshmark? Is eBay your favorite? Does Depop give you anxiety? <laughs> you need to decide what works for you and quiet the noise. I think the sooner you are more in touch with how you want to run your business, what platforms work for you, what brands work for you, what sort of social media platforms you want to be on. Do you like Instagram? Do you enjoy doing reels or TikToks? What works for you? There's so many options now with reselling. There is no one size fits all. And I think the sooner you can realize that in 2023, the more successful your business will be. And when you try things that you like and they don't work for you, you can go in a different direction. For example, I was intrigued by Amazon. I tried Amazon last year. Amazon was very profitable. I just didn't enjoy it. I like the hunt of thrifting. I don't enjoy retail arbitrage when it's that high pressure. I didn't like the bulky boxes of toys in my house that I was purchasing. I didn't like sending things FBA and weighing stuff and big boxes. Some people thrive with Amazon and they're making way more money than me. I just didn't like it. I tried it but I didn't like it. And then I moved into another direction. You also may notice that on my channel, I am not sharing as many stats as I used to. I remember, I think it was maybe last January, I shared like what I made during the year and it just left a really bad taste in my mouth. It's not that I don't like when other people share that sort of information. It's just not what I want this channel to be. I want my channel to be someplace where people can turn on YouTube and enjoy what they're hearing from me. Maybe they learn something. Maybe they find a strategy that I use that they want to implement. But overall, I want to entertain you. I want people to enjoy listening to me. I don't want to tell you what platforms you should be on, what platforms are awful, why I hate this. It's just not my thing. And I have made a really conscious effort to shift the narrative a little bit on this channel. I really enjoy doing thrift across New England. I love taking you to new places when I go thrifting. I enjoy sharing my adventures at the bins with you. I've really really leaned into my ship and shop videos where I kind of pull with you live the things that have sold in place of doing what sold videos and breaking down exactly my profit margins and stuff. I'm not a real technical person in case you haven't noticed. So that was not really working for me. There are other creators who are so good at giving technical information. You need to figure out what works for you and quiet the noise. And I think that goes for so many things in life, not just reselling. And I know it sounds corny, but you really should believe in yourself. You may admire another reseller and aspire to have a certain business model as they do, but you have to know what you're good at and trust yourself and your ability and uh, not always try to be chasing what somebody else is doing because it's really hard to, to be your own person when you're always trying to emulate someone else. Number four is very tailored to my business, but I think it is also applicable to a lot of people. So again, take this for what it's worth. I like to focus on the five pillars of reselling. This was a term that I coined a couple years ago. I did a series called From the Store to Your Door, where I chronicled like every step of how I resell from the store to the time that it ships out and it arrives at your door. And I've since done a video that focuses just on the five pillars of reselling, but I try to focus on these when I am actually out shopping. And so this kind of is specific to sourcing. Those five pillars are cost, comps, condition, style, and brand. Those are always the five things I'm looking at. And I would say that now more than ever, it's really important to look at your comps. And especially if you're just getting started in the business, a comp is a sold comparative. So if I have this iPhone case and I find it at a store and I want to sell it, I'm going to look up sold comparison. So what has this already sold for on different platforms? What did it sell for on eBay? What did it sell for on Poshmark? What is the sell through rate? Even if it's sold for a good amount, are there hundreds and hundreds of this exact phone case listed? Am I really going to make money if I sell this? What's the cost of this? Is it worth picking up for a dollar? Maybe. Is it worth picking up for 10? Looking at those five pillars is really important in my business for me 
to make successful decisions. As mentioned, cost is one of them. There may be an item that you look at and you say, the sold comps on this are $25, so I would pick it up if it were $3, but if this item was $10, the cost is too high, and that is going to impact my decision whether or not I wanna buy something. Condition, you may find the best brand at a great price, and the comps are fantastic, but it's got a really big stain or hole or something you can't repair, which is really going to impact what you make on that item. And it's sad sometimes. You may find a Gucci bag and it's destroyed and you're just not gonna make any money, even though all the other four pillars are present. If the condition is terrible, you might wanna let it go. On the flip side, there might be something that you find that is new with tag, but maybe it's just from Kohl's, but the comps aren't really bad and the cost is really low, and it's a new with tag item, and you can make $25 on that and it only cost you a dollar. And all the other things check out, so maybe you're gonna purchase that. Style is important. Madewell jeans are a really good example. I love selling Madewell jeans. Old style Madewell jeans with the old label that are skinny jeans, or now even I'm really avoiding jeans that are like shredded. I used to buy ripped jeans. I was like seeking them out. Now I feel like a little bit of distressing I think is still good, but I don't know that those like shredded American Eagle jeans from top to bottom are really in fashion anymore. So style is important even if you really love the brand. I can't tell you how many Stuart Weitzman shoes I have found that are just out of style. I have also found Stuart Weitzman shoes that sell for a lot of money. A Stuart Weitzman handbag that I found new with tag. The comps were fantastic. It sold for over $200 even though I typically find a lot of old stuff from that brand, style is really, really important in some cases. So all of those things together, I think will really help you decide what to purchase. And that's why that has its spot as number four in my top five things of what I would do differently in 2023. Cost, comps, condition, style, brand, boom. It's really important to take a little bit from all of the pillars to really make an educated decision on what to purchase. I hope those help you. Number five, what I would do differently, and I've implemented this along the way, and I still don't think I am the best at this, but number five is set measurable goals and be honest with yourself. How many items am I listing every day, every week, every month? I was just talking to Tina, who is my assistant who helps me with my listings, and Thriftless February is coming up. For those of you who are new to my channel, this is going to be my third or fourth year, I think my fourth year doing Thriftless February, and it is just what it sounds like it is. I thrift a lot less, I set a lot of measurable goals that month, and I really hone in on getting stuff listed and out the door, and I don't spend a lot of time in the thrift stores. In fact, I usually set goals or criteria that I need to achieve before I can go thrifting. Tina was just here and I have 300 drafts in Vendu. Vendu is where I do all of my listing. 300 drafts. So I said, Tina, my goal before the end of thr Thriftless February is to make sure that all of those drafts get listed. Now I can't just say that and think that it's magically going to happen. I need to go in with a plan. So in order to get those listed, assuming that I'm probably going to shop a little bit more in the month of January before Thriftless February, I said if I list seven items a day, that's 49 items a week, we can round it up and say 50. So if I do 50 items in a week, that means I'll get 200 new listings up in a month if I list seven items a day. So if one day I wake up and I only list three items by the end of the day, the next day I need to list 10 items to keep that seven item average going. I can't expect to list 200 items if I'm only listing one or two items a day. I can't expect those drafts to magically list themselves. We're just wrapping up the first week of January. So if I start next week and I list seven items a week, by the time I get to February 1st, that gives me like three full weeks of listing about 50 items per day. That means on February 1st, I'll be at about 150 more listings that I need to get done. Maybe in February, I up that to eight or nine listings a day or 10 listings a day. I'll be able to list more in the month of February because I won't be sourcing and I won't be bringing more inventory into the house. I am not really good at creating this structure myself, so I literally have to pick a month 
to say, this month you are not thrifting. And anybody who wants to join me for Thriftless February, you are welcome to. We set goals together and uh, last year, February was my most profitable month. I did the least amount of shopping and I had my highest sales. Some other things you wanna be honest with yourself about, what is measurable, what is your average cost of goods, what is your average selling price, how much money am I spending each month thrifting or on business expensive expenses? What platform is doing the best? Is it worth it for me to keep listing on eBay if Poshmark is blowing eBay out of the water? And if I'm being honest with myself, am I listing as many items on eBay as I am on Poshmark? And I am not. I think I have 450. It's getting up there. For a while I was in the 300s. Now I'm pushing 500 listings on eBay and I've been doing better because I have about that 150 extra listings on eBay this year or in the past six months than I had in prior time, but I have 1,300 listings on Poshmark. So just being honest with yourself and actually looking at your numbers and helping your numbers give you real information about your business and not just going off of feelings. You might wanna look at what your sell-through rate is. You might wanna look at what stores you're sourcing from and which ones are actually bringing you more profit. Like I have this one store that I really like, I love the staff there, but when I look at the stuff that I end up getting there, my sell-through rate isn't as good at that store as it is in some of the stores I source from that are closer to Boston. The information that you gain by looking at those numbers is going to help you with how you run your business in the future. What categories sell well for you? Do you spend a ton of time buying shoes, but then you never get to listing those shoes or cleaning those shoes? Is that really a good use of your time? Being honest with yourself and looking at your numbers can really help your business in 2023 and always. Of course, I have to do a little honorable mention because number six, it's not really so much what I would do differently, but I do think it's really helpful for your business. And that is having the right tools for reselling. And I didn't want to include this in my top five because I really don't believe that you have to go out and spend a lot of money to become a reseller. So a few things that I think are really great for your business when you're ready. A printer. I have this old printer. It's called Faux Memo. It's very quirky at this point. Knock on wood. I've had it for almost four years. The thermal printer is a game changer. It's so much faster for you. You can print things from home and then you're saving money because you're not bringing stuff to the post office and getting like just over-the-counter rates. You, you save money when you're printing things through eBay. Pirate shipping offers discounted shipping for you. So having a printer at home is so amazing. And I did not get a fancy printer and it has really served me well. There was another brand that I had that I did not like and it was all on a roller. Uh, I really like my labels, my four by six labels flat. Um, what the heck was, oh, a Dymo. I didn't like the Dymo. That was something that was recommended from another reseller. I tried it, it didn't work for me. I appreciated the guidance on it and the recommendation. I used it for about a year, I didn't love it, and now I use the faux memo. You may hate the faux memo. It works for me. It's quirky, but it works for me. Also, uh, if I were starting in 2023, I would not buy all the fancy poly mailers. There is so much that you can get at USPS.com for free. I order all my shoe boxes online. The medium flat rate boxes, if you're selling through Poshmark, you can use flat rate boxes. I am more and more and more frequently using the free items as opposed to getting the plastic decorative poly mailers. These free Tyvek mailers you can order these online. You can grab them when you're dropping things off at the post office. I am a huge fan of free mailers. Also, another thing that I would do differently in 2023 regarding tools and just things that are accessible to me is I would start porch pickups immediately if you have them in your area. They will pick up my packages on my front door and it just makes me hustle in the morning. In 2023, there are so many cross-listing services that are available to you. There weren't when I got started. Um, I use Vendu, which I absolutely love. There's also List Perfectly. There are a couple options that you have. Doesn't matter which one you choose, obviously. I would recommend Vendu. I've been using Vendu since 2019. This particular video is not sponsored by Vendu. I just love them. And it really has helped 
boost my sales. There are certain things that I just know myself would never get listed on multiple platforms if it weren't for a cross-listing service. If you have been struggling to keep that part of your business organized, a cross-listing service can be so wonderful, but it is cost. So, so if somebody were just starting their business, I hate to recommend things that cost money. Printer, the free mailers, business card. Oh, business credit card. That's the last thing I wanna mention, and then we'll wrap it up for today. Once I got my business credit card that said Lori's Boston Found, and I charged everything on, I charge everything on that credit card, it has made things so much easier for my accountant, AKA my husband. We didn't do this until at least a year into my business. But now that we have a separate credit card, it's on file for Amazon, so all of my supplies, when I go thrifting, everything gets put on that credit card. It makes our lives so much easier. That didn't cost any money. So if you can get a separate credit card, and filter everything through that and just keep it separate from your family money, it really, really makes a big difference. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you found some value in today's video, please be sure to give it a thumbs up. Subscribe to my channel if you would like to see more from me. Hit the bell notification if you wanna be notified when I release a video. I typically do it twice a week. I'm going to be doing more in this top five series, so feel free to leave a comment, any top five things that you would like me to go over. Let me know how you enjoyed this style of video and let me know if I missed something because like I said, you can only take cafeteria style from people. I am sure I missed some really valuable tips. So leave your best tip and what you would do in 2023 and then we can all learn from each other. Thank you guys so much for being here. I love you and I'll be back soon with another video. Bye.